On today's show, Professor of Horticulture Brian Kahn talks about some research being conducted using companion plantings to protect squash plants. We are also joined by Tulsa County Extension Horticulture Educator Kenda Woodburn, who shows a research plot that is using floating row covers to protect squash. Former host Steve Owens looks at some beautiful euphorbias in the landscape, and Barbara Brown bakes peach oatmeal bars. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We're at the Cimarron Valley Research Station today, and I'm showing what I've got here with a squash companion planting study. This is actually the third year for it. Some of you may have seen the episode that was taped a few years back. What we've got is yellow straight neck summer squash and it's interplanted in this case with just one herb and this is feverfew. It's here in the middle. We have also looked at white yarrow in the past and we're looking at that in some additional plots but we don't have it here at Perkins. The configuration you're looking at in these plots, you see you have squash plants on the edge of the bed and the fever few down the middle. And you can see that the fever few plants have gotten pretty good size to them. These were actually planted about two weeks before we transplanted the squash in order to give them a head start. You can easily see that they're open to the sun here. We've got the squash on the sides. What we're trying to do is we're hoping that the squash will kind of fall away a little bit to the edge of the bed and leave the fever few open in the middle so that they're not in as much competition with the squash as they've been. One of the problems we found is that eventually the squash gets so big that they overwhelm the herbs. This is a uh, trick, if you would, a way to try to preserve the herbs a little bit longer. And there's still two fever few plants paired up with each squash. Well, companion planting is an interesting subject to study because there's a lot of, if you would, folk information about it, but there's very little in the scientific literature that either says it works or it doesn't. So that's why we've undertaken this three-year study, is to try to provide some scientific data to see how well it works. Earlier on, we showed you a plot with the fever few in the middle. This is a different configuration these were also planted two weeks ahead of the squash, but now we've got the fever few almost in what you would call a wall on the edge of the plots and two squash per hill in the middle. This is the configuration that we've also got on the cooperating growers farms and what we looked at in the pilot study in 2013. The idea is to just kind of create a barrier on the edge of the plots so hopefully if the squash bugs moving in and they don't like the fever few they kind of hit that barrier and it deters them and gives the squash more protection. The disadvantage is that pretty soon the squash are going to get big and overwhelm those plants and that's why we thought we might try to give them a two-week head start. We've also got treatments here where they were planted at the same time as the squash and that's what we've been doing in the past. Now some of these plants look a little rough this year and as I'm sure you're aware we've had record rainfall in Oklahoma and so we've had some problems with that even with our raised beds here. One of the problems that we run into is illustrated here and this is poor pollination. 
What you see here in my left hand is a squash that has not been completely pollinated and you can see that down here the seeds haven't developed inside and so the squash is not fully developed around it. Whereas here in my right hand, this is the normal yellow straight neck squash. This is what we hope it should look like with proper pollination. The bees don't like the rain any more than we do. And so that's been the problem. You can see that squash is insect pollinated. It's got these big flowers that are very attractive to bees. But if the bees aren't working because they don't like the weather, you're not going to get adequate pollination. Another problem we've had from excessive rainfall is an actual rot on the blossom end of some of the fruit. And we'll show you that next. Well, here's an example of a squash with the rot that's coming in from the blossom end. It's normal in squash sometimes to have a fungus come and attack the wilting flower, but it really takes off when you have all of the wet weather like we had this year. And now the fungus hasn't stopped with the flower. It's gone back into the ovary, into the future squash fruit, and you can see that it's rotting it. And this is, this is going to end up being a cull. We've seen this at all three locations this year. It's been a real problem, and it's just due to the excessive rain. Well, this is the third year of the study, and we don't have final results yet. We're waiting to see what we get from our three locations this year. We can say that it looks like there's some possibility that the squash bugs don't like the plots with the fever few as well as the plots that don't have either the yarrow or no herbs at all. But we have to get some more information and more data here before we can make an actual conclusion. And nothing's going to prevent the squash bug. The best that we can do is to try to deter them and reduce the total numbers through the use of these herbs. Now, I know companion planting is of interest to a lot of folks. And again, I want to emphasize that a lot of the information is, if you would, folk information. And what little bit is there from a scientific standpoint, it's always best to go to a university resource and see what your cooperative extension service can advise you about it. Hi, my name is Kenda Woodburn. I'm a horticulture extension educator for Tulsa County. And we're here at the Bixby, Bixby Vegetable Research Station. And around me are squash plants that were planted by, from seed in July and their enterprise variety. This study was a study that was um, funded by SARE, Southern SARE. And there's three different sites for this. There's Atoka County, Pottawatomie County, and then Tulsa County are doing this study. And in it, we were looking at preventing insects from coming into eating squash plants and squash by using floating row covers. As you can see, this is an Agrabond floating row cover. Um, when the study was first started, what we did, we came in and we um, laid down plasticulture with drip irrigation underneath. And we have three replications of five different treatments. Each of the treatments was covered like this one is until um, the plants got big enough where there's 50% flowering. And the only one that wasn't covered initially was these with the top cover. We had it to um, just kind of protect them from the full sun when we first planted them since it was in July and it's very hot as you know in Oklahoma in July. And so subsequently after we um, had that 50% flowering we would remove one whole one of these at a time. We're using these clips and um, we have a wire running around the base and what this does is exclude squash bugs and then there other insects from getting in up, up underneath. But Once we had 50% flowering we started removing this because we need to let the insect pollinators in. Now at two of the other sites, they're, they are lifting them up and leaving them open for part of the day and then shutting them each day. At this site, we decided just to do a very low tech way where every week we'd remove from each of these different um, replicated studies, treatments, one, one of these. So this week, tomorrow's our field day, we are going to remove the last covers. And I want to show you what these plants look like right now underneath this. I'm going to show you how healthy they are. Whenever we remove these, we have not seen any insect damage or any sort of damage underneath. 
Um, but when we remove them, any fruit you see here is basically not pollinated and it'll drop off. But once we remove the floating row covers, we start getting, we have lots of flowers and we start getting insect pollination right away. And it from the time they're pollinated to the time they're able to be picked, it, it takes less than a week oftentimes. And what I like to do when I'm picking the squash is just to get down in here and look for, I look for ones about six to eight inches long. That's a little bit smaller than what I want. Here's one a little bit bigger, but I'll go ahead and I like to use a knife, either twist it or cut it so you can make sure that you don't damage the plant because when you wound the plant, it can bring more insects in. So I take this and we like to pick in the cool of the day. And here's one that actually, this grew from last Thursday from a little plant to this size in one week. This is how much growth we're having. And so you really want to pick them a little bit smaller, but these are still edible. They're not too tough. But this is good for home gardens because a number of the home gardeners I spoke with this year could not get any plants because the squash bugs came in and squash borers. We've not seen any squash borers or squash bugs on this planting. We did plant it in July and we had everything covered except the, the untreated plot that was open. And so when we lifted them up, didn't see any insect damage. And then immediately we started getting pollinators come in and start pollinating. So it's, it's an easy, you can find that we, we actually used Agribond for the um, cover, but I've seen the same type of material or similar to it at some of the local garden stores and also from farm tech and, and some of the online catalogs. And it's not that expensive. And if you're careful, you can reuse it for a couple years. And as far as making the hoops, you can either use flexible PVC pipe and put rebar on either end and then bend it over. And these are not hard to make. And it really will help you be able to get a good squash um, crop. Okay, I just showed you a squash that was a little bit small and one that's too big. Here's one that's just the size I like to harvest them at. And when I harvest them, I like to be careful not to damage the plant. Because one thing, every time you make a wound in a plant, it opens it up for diseases. And also there's different um, uh, signals that can alert insects that there's a sick or hurt plant. So when I come in, I either twist it gently or I use my little Swiss Army knife here and I cut it. And look at this, just a beautiful squash. And see, this is where the blossom was. I pull that off because you want that to dry down so it doesn't um, rot. And I like to pick it before it's too hot in the day. Like right now, when I hold this, it feels cool to my hand. If you're picking it and it feels warm to your hand, you're picking it too late. And what you want to do, as soon as you harvest enough of the squash, you want to take it and put it in a cool place and either process it or put it in your refrigerator right away. So you make sure you don't have field heat in there. So the, the better quality and the less bruises you have, see right there, there's already a little bruise, even though I've been very careful, the longer your squash will last. Care should be taken when handling any member of the Euphorbia family. Just uh, be careful of the, the sap uh, because it can cause some rashes or some, some skin irritation. And you don't want to put any part of any of these plants in your mouth. However, the cassava or the tapioca is a plant used in countries uh, around the world as a top choice of calories. It's, uh, it's consumed uh, in great amounts. And we happen to have a variegated form of the plant right back here. It's very showy, very nice ornamental, but again, all parts are poisonous except when the roots are powdered and put through a special process to reduce the toxicity. But we love the variegated form of tapioca as a nice ornamental. There are a number of ornamental plants in the Euphorbia family. Some of my favorites are the Acalifas. We've got one right here. This one's known as Kona Gold. It's not winter hardy. It is a tropical, but uh, you just put a few of these plants in your garden and they give you beautiful color throughout the year. Again, this is Kona Gold with the green and chartreuse splashed leaves. Right down here, we have one of my favorites. It's called Inferno. It's got the copper colored leaves that throughout the year, depending on the temperature, uh, change color a little bit. We sometimes grow those into standards. Another really showy member of the Euphorbia family is this plant. This is Caribbean copper plant, Euphorbia catenifolia. That word catenifolia lets us know 
that the leaves of this plant are very similar or they look like the leaves of the purple smoke tree. Now this is a tender plant, uh, will not survive the winters in Oklahoma, but it's absolutely breathtaking, giving us this burgundy color in the garden throughout the summer months. Right down here is one of those succulent plants I was telling you about in the Euphorbia family. This is variegated corn cob plant. Looks a bit like a cactus with these kind of woody spines. Uh, you don't want to just grab the plant, but uh, they're not just uh, needle sharp. But uh, the pink tones are coming on because of the cooler weather here in the fall. A great plant in a pot for the patio. Bring this inside for the winter as well. Here at the Bixby Vegetable Research Station, there's been years and years of um, plants planted out here from soybean to grapes to um, all different kind of vegetables. And through the years, sometimes we haven't always put in cover crops because you want to do that every so often to rebuild the soil. And the soil here in Bixby is wonderful, but it needs a little boost now and then to replenish some of what we've taken out of it. And what I have planted here is buckwheat. We used a grain drill to put it in. And this whole field is eventually gonna be turned over into other crops. So right now we put in buckwheat. We want it to grow and so that it, it flowers because it's a very good flower for pollinators. We do have some beehives here on the station and there's a number of local beekeepers and we'd like to see this as, a, as an example of how to treat your soil. So what we'll do is we'll let this flower and then we'll turn it under and or we'll just mow it and leave the stubble there and then intercede with a, a like an arrow, arrow leaf clover or a different type of clover and just build up the soil so then when we're ready to plant with these new crops we have ideas we're going to put in then it'll be ready to go right now the um, when i did the soil test the, the everything was a little bit low the nitrogen phosphorus potassium and the, and the organic matter was a little bit low all this will help add more back especially when we put the clover in we'll be adding more nitrogen and um, we just want to make this even a better research station than it's always been. It's always been wonderful to have this and it's so nice that we have it here for um, forever because the man that donated this, he gave it to us to use so we never would sell it but always have it for research for vegetable and fruit and other crops. Today we're doing peach oatmeal bars. Now I don't often do real true desserts, but I think everybody needs to have one in their goodie bag of things that they can prepare with fairly short notice. So this one is peach oatmeal. The oatmeal is the whole grain. Uh, the peaches, of course, are, are the fruits, so it, we're gonna kind of mask it as a healthy food, although it really doesn't fall in that category. And this is why. I'm gonna start with eight tablespoons or one stick of unsalted butter. You could probably cut that down a little bit, but if we're going whole hog, this is just one of those things that you're going to want to eat a smaller piece of. Now this is unsalted butter, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and, and add the other ingredients. I've got um, uh, one cup of old-fashioned oats, one cup of flour, and that's just all-purpose flour, a fourth of a teaspoon of kosher salt, so we're keeping the salt low, uh, half a cup of packed brown sugar, which is the only way to measure it. And then a half a cup of wal uh, walnuts in this case. You could use pecans also. You don't need to toast them. This is all going in the oven. They're going to toast there. Now while we're, we're stirring this, the, the thing about this one is you need to get your hands dirty. And every cook should know how to do that. As long as they're clean, you'll be fine. You could use gloves if you choose. The butter is uh, looked like a stick when I started. Our goal here is to keep kneading this and working it until we can no longer see the butter, until there are no large chunks. Normally, I'd cut these, this in, uh, but with oatmeal and nuts, even if we added those later, you're still going to have to do some work with your hands. Now I mentioned that the butter is unsalted and you may have wondered as you've wandered through the grocery store shelves why is some of the butter salted and why is some of it not. You may have wondered when you're looking at a recipe that says for unsalted butter and like this one then put some salt in later. The salt is there for flavor primarily and the two butters are actually pretty much interchangeable unless it's something uh, very fine like a, 
a fine white cake and then you probably are going to want to stick with unsalted. Uh, it also adds a little bit of a preservative to it, uh, so you get those two benefits from uh, that combination. If it does call for salt and you're working with a baked good or something like this and you only have salted butter and the recipe calls for additional salt, you may want to cut back on the additional salt just a little bit uh, or altogether uh, just so that it doesn't taste too salty when you get to it. Remember this is, we're starting with uh, whole oats here, old fashioned oats. All oats, whether they're steel cut, uh, stone ground, old fashioned, quick or instant, they are all whole grain. Uh, so this does qualify as a, as a whole grain product and we have a fair amount of it here. You could probably also substitute uh, some or all uh, whole wheat flour for this. So this is ready to go now. I'm going to set it aside. Now what I've done here is I have two 8 inch square pans and I have two because I want to show you the difference. This is a glass 8 inch pan as you could probably tell uh, and this one's metal. In fact this is an old fashioned aluminum one. If you're using glass, we're going to preheat the oven to 350 because the glass uh, allows the heat the waves to move through uh, much faster. You should always lower the temperature of the oven 25 degrees if you're using a glass pan. Whichever kind of pan you're using, however, line it with parchment. Put one sheet across this way, one sheet across that way. And this keeps it from sticking to the pan for one thing. Uh, it also makes it easier to clean up, which I'm always for, uh, but it also helps um, with uh, your ability to get things out easier. So uh, this one, the, the sheets are probably a little bit larger than you need, so fold them down a little bit so they aren't sticking out all around. We do uh, not want to get them on the sides of the oven. We don't want to cause any kind of fire issue at all. We're going to go back to our base mixture here, and I'm going to take out about a cup. And I'm going to put it aside because we're going to use that as the topping later on. And then put about three quarters of your base mix here into your prepared pan and then press it down. I'm using a metal um, measuring cup. If you're willing, you could use your hands. In fact, even though I'll press it down fairly firmly with the measuring cup, uh, I'll come back to it and press the corners with my fingers just to make sure that I got it uh, in well all the way around. When that's fairly firm, make sure you wipe off the bottom. Uh, again, go back and press in the edges. Make sure that uh, it's firm all the way uh, to the sides. And then we're going to go ahead with our next ingredient. Uh, the next things we're going to do are filling. Now I am using a strawberry, or strawberries, peaches from uh, the freezer. If it's peach season and you've got really fresh peaches and they're really juicy and they're great eating peaches, by all means, if you have them and you're willing to sacrifice them to a baked item instead of actually eating them fresh, they'd be wonderful in here. Just make sure you blanch them or peel them, pit them, slice them fairly thinly, uh, and they'll be ready to go. You need about two cups. Uh, so uh, I'm using frozen, frozen peaches that you're putting into the freezer right now. They are not eternally good in the freezer. You do need to use them within 6 to 12 months. If you are going through the winter and you're finding that you're not using them, you need to make a plan for them. You pay for things in the freezer each month because you pay your electric bill to keep the freezer running. So the cost of the peaches in the freezer continues to rise. And inversely, the quality of the peaches goes down. Uh, so the eating quality, the nutrition quality, safety, they're good, but from other standpoints, you lose. So I'm going to add to our peaches because they are going to be juicy when they're baked. I'm going to add a half a teaspoon of cornstarch and I'm going to add a fourth of a teaspoon of ground ginger, a tablespoon of sugar, and if your peaches are really sweet you may decide to leave that one out, uh, and then a fourth of a teaspoon of ground cinnamon. We're going to stir these together and they're just going to go on top of our peaches. Remember your oven is preheating at 350 degrees. Once you get these fairly well blended, you're just going to put them on top of your mixture here, of the base, and kind of spread them out a little bit. Now the peaches should be pretty well thawed if you're using frozen peaches, otherwise it's going to extend the baking time. Uh, so the baking time on this particular recipe is going to be somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes based on how thawed your peaches are or whether or not they're fresh and of course the variation from oven to oven. Going back, getting the rest of the topping, we're just going to sprinkle this over the top 
And then I'm going to pat it down just a little bit to make sure that it, it firmly adheres. I don't want it falling off when people are eating them later on. So pat that down and that one's ready to go. In the oven, 30 to 45 minutes, 350 degrees. Now we're going to come back to this one. This is one that I baked earlier. Notice that we've lined it with parchment and here's where you get the benefit of having that parchment lining. It lifts straight out, comes out on the board. You need to let it cool for at least 30 minutes, maybe longer before this will do this. Then you just cut it in. It should make at least nine servings. Fewer if you're worried about the number of calories or the number, amount of sugar that you're getting from this one. Remember, this is an occasional treat, not a daily occurrence. So it's okay to have it something special once in a while. I hope you'll give this one a try. It's Peach Oatmeal Bars for Oklahoma Gardening. I'm Barbara Brown. Next week, Steve Owens is back to talk about euphorbias and milkweeds. Then we travel to Oklahoma City where urban forester Mark Bays shows how they are saving a couple of beautiful trees in the middle of a street renovation. And turfgrass specialist Dennis Martin is at the Oklahoma City National Memorial to talk about why zoysia grass was the appropriate turf grass to use with the memorial's design and location. So join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.